Good morning, Hilton Baptist Church. Good morning, Wagner. Morning, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I see that everybody's found their seats, or almost everybody. Um, it's really great seeing you all here this morning. It's my privilege to welcome you to our church service. It's a special morning today. Special welcome to our guest speaker, Ed Ramsami, who's here with us, or I believe so. I'm trying to see where he is. Is he hiding? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a wonderful morning today. Great meeting all here in church. It's also a special day for a lot of other people not here in church today. As you all know, there's a lot trying to run all the way down to Durban this morning. Um, I think we're all happy to be comfortably seated here and just listening. I think a lot of them would, is going to have a hard, long day, and they'll have to really push hard through some difficult times today. And that pushing made me think of a young man living in a small rural village in Africa. He was a really devout, faithful Christian, and one night praying, the Lord gave him a task. He said, I want you from now on every day to go outside and you see this big boulder outside your hut, I want you to push that boulder. So he was quite excited having a clear message of what he needs to do. That doesn't happen often to any of us. The next morning he went out, went searching for that boulder. He saw it. It was a bit bigger than he expected it to be, but he was asked to push it, so he started pushing that boulder. He spent that whole day pushing. That night he was extremely tired and the boulder did not move at all. But he thought, well, maybe, maybe he, he just nudged it or loosened it a bit, so the next day he would try again. And that carried on for a few days, going into weeks and months. Every night he was really tired and spent, but the boulder did not move. So after a while, he started to doubt himself a little bit. Um, is he a failure? Is he not doing what he's supposed to do? And that was just the chance that the devil was looking for to, to also speak to him and say, why are you doing this? Why are you spending all your energy in trying to move that boulder? There's no way you're going to do that. If it was me, I would just pretend to push. No one would know. It would look the same. And then at least he won't be that tired. And the guy thought, well, that's, uh, that's maybe a good idea. Maybe you should try that. But he was also a bit uncertain and not comfortable with, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, you asked me to push this boulder, and I did as you asked. Why does it feel like I'm a failure? I'm trying my best, and the boulder is not moving at all. So the Lord said to him, I asked you to push the boulder, and you were obedient. You listened to me, and you did push the boulder. Never ever did I ask you that I expect you to move the boulder. And you say that you're a failure. But is that really so? Look at yourself. Look how strong you've got. Look at your arms. Look at how strong your legs are, your calloused hands. Now, after months of doing this, your ability far exceeds what you had before all of this started. Uh, what I ask from you is to be faithful, follow my command, and push. Now I will be the one that will move this boulder. And I think that's the same for a lot of us. The Lord often asks us to do something, and then we use our own intellect to try and decipher what he wants from us and see if we can do it in any different way. But all he wants is simple obedience and simple faith. Yes, we should have faith to move the mountain, but we should also remember that it will be God that's going to move the mountains. All he wants from us is to push. He wants me and you to push. And if that doesn't make sense to you, let's look at the letters of the word push. P U S and H. Pray until something happens. So if if the world seems too difficult for you, God wants us to push. If life seems hard and you don't know where to turn, just push. If you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, push. If people don't understand you, push. 
if you just don't know what to do. God wants us to push. So let us close our eyes and all give a great big push together. Father in heaven, it's such a wonderful day. We thank you that we can meet in your name on this special morning. Thank you for your faithful love, that we can know that you are faithful, that we can trust in you. Please help us and keep our faith strong that we, that we, we would hand everything in our lives to you and trust you to provide in every matter, in everything that we do. Help us to remain faithful. And if we have difficulty, to come straight to you and pray, Lord, because you are our God. And we thank you for the blessing that we have received from you. Please bless this morning's service, everyone here. Please bless Ed as he speaks to us. Make our hearts receive the message that comes from you. And on this day, I also want to pray to everyone running down to Durban. Please keep them safe and strong. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome everybody uh, from me. It's lovely to see you all here this morning, and uh, I'm glad to see that there aren't so many people from Hilton Baptist running that race uh, that, um, <coughs> yeah, that you need to be a little bit crazy to do. Sorry, Moira, not, not, not you, but everybody else. Um, but uh, welcome. It's lovely to have you all here today, and a special welcome to you if you are visiting us. It's really lovely to have you with us here today. And just to say that if you are visiting us, there probably are a few things that you'd like to know. Firstly, just to tell you that we have tea and coffee and there's a nice spread of eats uh, today. So please do stay after the service uh, for tea and coffee and just to meet some people and to say hello. And we would love to... Uh, know uh, uh, of your visit, and if you would like to know a little bit more about Hilton Baptist, the place to go is our information table uh, on my left and your right, just at the exit to the church. There's all sorts of interesting things there. There's a brochure that tells you about our church. There's a little uh, form you can fill out if you would like to give a record of your visit. Uh, there's some rather interesting articles uh, that Zara put there, and I hold no responsibility for them. Well, maybe a little bit. Um, and there's also, there's also some books uh, from our library that you might like to have a look at. So if you'd like to just find out more, that's the place to go um, after you've got your cup of tea and coffee. Um, and then if you are a visitor, you might want to know where the bathrooms are. So just let me tell you that if you are a gent, then you need to go out that door and just after the kitchen are the gents. If you're a lady, you can also go out that door, but you have to go all the way around or you can just go through this door, just past the creche. And um, while we're very happy for little ones to be in the service, if uh, mom or dad is getting a bit frustrated and finding it difficult, there is a creche for you to go to. But there's also uh, all sorts of uh, Sunday schools that are happening. So firstly, um, after I have finished, then the little ones will go with Ellie, out to what we call Uptown, which is the prefab building just over there. You access it through the back door. And uh, the primary school children up to grade six will go down to downtown with Werner, who you've already met uh, today, and he will be taking you. If you are grade six and up and would normally go with Zara, look, she's here, so you have to stay here. Um, just for today, uh, we are <coughs> including you in our full service here this morning. Right. So welcome to all the visitors. Special welcome to my friend Ed. It's good to have you here, Ed. Uh, Ed and I go back a long, long way. We've kind of intersected from time to time over the course of our lives. He was a first-year student when I was a final-year student at college. I don't know if he behaved himself. Actually, you probably did better than me uh, then, but uh, we met then. Ed was then involved with youth ministry. Uh, he pastored a couple of churches, one of which happened to be the church that my sister and her family attend in Johannesburg. Uh, so we kind of intersected a bit there. Then he joined Youth for Christ and uh, was their national director for a few years, for several years in fact. And many of you may remember Greg and Roxanne who were part of our church. Well, 
they worked for him in those days and would still do so because they're still with YFC in George. He's recently just moved to an organization called the Global Network of Evangelists. And uh, he uh, was part of the AE mission last week uh, here in Peter Maritzburg. So, so Ed comes to us very well qualified, and we are looking forward to what you have to say today. Thank you for coming uh, all the way from Joburg. He, uh, no, from Durban. He went up when the runners went down, but I think you, you were better qualified for that. The only thing that Ed has got wrong today is that he forgot that Hilton requires the wearing of a jersey. So if he starts shivering, it's not because he's nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we probably need to put a heater on. But uh, welcome to you, Ed. It's lovely to have you with us today. Just a few notices to tell you about uh, that should be coming up on your screen. The first and most important one is we want to invite you all to attend a course that we're having in September and October called Christianity Explained. So today you'll be hearing the gospel explained to you and uh, uh, we'll hear that. But sometimes we find that people need uh, time to kind of work it out, to answer all their questions, to check that actually this Christian faith is the real deal. And so that's what Christianity Explained will be all about. It'll be an opportunity to come and understand and hear the, the Christian gospel, the Christian message explained over an extended period of time. There'll be no pressure on you. You don't have to answer any questions. You won't even have to read uh, the, from the Bible or pray or anything funny like that. But there will be opportunities for discussion as we work our way through who Jesus is, why he came, and what that means for us. So please join us on Wednesday evenings starting the 16th of September, carrying on for six weeks on uh, between 7 and 8.30. We're looking forward to you all joining. You should have a little brochure um, that was given to you this morning about that. And if you don't, you can find some more of those at the information table. A couple of other things to tell you about Hilton Baptist. We always have an evening service. And today, yes, Zara is the speaker. So you don't want to miss that. The parable of the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, we look forward to hearing you, Zara, tonight. We always have prayer meetings on Monday evenings. We meet by Zoom, so we don't have to uh, come out in the, in the dark, and uh, uh, we send a link onto our WhatsApp group. If you'd like to join that and would like to join our church WhatsApp group, please uh, let us know, and we would like to include you in that. We also have prayer meetings on Sunday before church, if you uh, can remember to get here a bit early. And uh, then also we have youth activities happening on Friday evenings. Yes, thank you, Zara. <laughs> you know the important events are the ones that get clapped in here. Eh? Right. So we have uh, Never Too Young for grade ones to fives between 5.30 and 6.30. We have Never Too Young for grade six and sevens between 5.30 and 6.30. They're gonna, you're going to have to find another name. For never too young between six for grade six and sevens and then youth uh, for high school between seven and nine so you're all welcome to join that a very good morning to all of you or i should say a very warm morning to all of you because that maybe helps me uh just one more very special guest i want to welcome um that dave forgot earlier sorry dave it's all my bad um <laughs> helen's with me at the back um that's my cheerleader my support crew um i thought keeping in theme with the comrades and having seconders i thought i'd have mine come with us as well so she's um my seconder my encourager and the one that will keep me on track with time as well uh, your pastor tells me i've got until 10 30 um, but he did mention that we eat with the coffee as well, so we'll see how we go. But I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. The more responsive you are, the more you wave and the more you say yes, maybe even throw in, that's good preaching. We, we may even end a little bit sooner than 10.30. So it, <laughs> you see what you're going to do next week? You see what you're going to do? <laughs> Suddenly this Baptist church became very charismatic. <laughs> Cool. Uh, I was also nervous, Dave, because we kind of, as we were chatting throughout the week, um, we kind of both realized, hey, it's Comrade Sunday, and it's going to be, you know, a bit busy on the roads. Also, we're not sure how many people may or may not be here, so I decided to rent a crowd. It's very encouraging for a preacher if you come to a church and there's no one there. Um, 
it's very, very discouraging. So what I did is I mentioned to my good friend Gary Almeida, who's from African Enterprise down the road, and uh, Gary really went all out. He brought Sue and their daughter Grace. Uh, has Grace gone off to the kids' ministry? <laughs> That's one wise young lady right there. So, But it's great to be with you guys. And as you've heard from Dave, um, we were together. I think I was trying to calculate. Yeah, some 25-odd years ago, um, I was half the man I was back then, and so were you. Um, <laughs> But there's also a couple of faces that I recognize from some 30-odd years ago. Uh, your drummer, Craig Fincham, um, was this little kid. I'd like to see you still like beating things. Uh, <laughs> back then, it was his younger brother, but now at least he's graduated to drums. And good to see Robin. Um, Robin, he could not remember how long you guys have been married. So that's a conversation you can have during tea. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure by the end of today, Craig will remember. So, but it's great to see you guys and uh, good to have... Well, I noticed you injured yourself, Craig. You were walking with a bit of a limp. Do you want to care to tell the church how you did that? <laughs> no, okay, I'd rather not. Okay. If you want to find out, ask him during tea. Um, he'll let you know. Now, I've come to preach God's word, not to connect with old and new friends. And if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do... Yep. Uh, whatever format, again, you can have it hard copy, uh, you can have it on your phones, but here's the deal again. If you are going to look on your phone, on the, whatever app you're going to be using, please, uh, if you tag me on any of the social media platforms, please be encouraging again, please be kind, please be good, and uh, thanks for going and finding some really good photos of me. Wow, those are very old photos, as you can see. The stalker. All right, let's get to God's word before this gets really bad. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 is where I want to go this morning. And again, I'm so grateful for some of the songs that we've been singing, some of the thoughts that have already prepared our minds. And it's so encouraging when worship does that. Worship is not, you know, there's the, the Sunday morning experience is not just all these bits and pieces that we kind of go through. That everything in some way leads us to that point. And so now as we look at Isaiah 6, I want you to just allow the words of the worship that we've been singing um, just to kind of again just reverberate in our minds. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted. Uh, the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth, the whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. But my eyes, my eyes have seen the Lord, the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Just that far this morning. And again, for those of you that have been in church for a very long time, it's a well-known passage of Scripture. But I prayed this morning that as, you, as we go through this text, that you will get to hear God maybe whisper something to you, God maybe say something strongly to you about who He is and what He has done for us. And the reason as we've been kind of thinking and planning and, uh, you know, Dave reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and he said, hey, we'd love for you to come. This is the Sunday. And as I've been thinking and praying and preparing myself to this message, it reminded me of an occasion, and it happened also in Durban uh, a good few years ago. I was doing some work, um, kind of what I call freelance work, just working out in the corporate space, trying to generate some income so that I could supplement my income to work in the ministry. And uh, one of those that I got to do was as a company based here in Durban. And I go to them, and it's, as some of you know, you know, these workshops are great, and lunch is always the highlight, isn't it? And so we line up for lunch, and as we're making our way to the lunch, the organizer of the event says, oh, I'm so sorry, we didn't organize lunch for you. And I thought that was quite puzzling, because when I looked in front of me, there was a buffet spread out. 
and I was a bit concerned. I said, you know, I, yes, <laughs> it does look like I eat a lot, but I think we're covered <laughs> with the buffet. And she says, no, 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 no I'm sorry. We, we didn't prepare halal. which I was even now more alarmed. And I said to her, but why would you think that? Why would you think I would need a lot? She says, but surely your faith. And I said, no, my faith says I can eat everything. As you see, I eat everything. <laughs> and she paused and she looked at me again and then she went, what faith is that? You see, I'm, I'm quite purposeful with that sometimes. I don't just come out and say it. And I said, you know, no, I'm a faith. And I remember on a flight once someone said to me, what do you do? And while I was being a pastor at a local church, I didn't want to say pastor because one of two things happens. Have you noticed, Dave? The moment you say pastor, either suddenly, instantly, insomnia, they're sleeping. <laughs> or secondly, they'll lean in and they'll have all the questions that they wanted to ask you about God. So the lady looks at me and I said to her, uh, you know, what faith? And I said, well, I'm a Christian. And, and I wish I had my phone ready to take a photo of her face because her eyes went really big, her, her jaw dropped, and she went, you! <laughs> now, I don't know if how I was behaving earlier in the day <laughs> would make her think that I wasn't. And I said, why? What, what, what? She says, no. She, she kind of paused and she said, I, wow. She said, I, yeah, it's taken me. She says, I haven't met an Indian Christian. And for her, that was quite alarming. And then she kind of leaned in for a moment, you know, and she says, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She said to me, why? Because, you know, there's Hinduism, there's Islam, there's, you know, all these others, and, and Baha'i. Why did you choose Christianity? And I smiled, and I thought, what a great setup to share the gospel. And I said to her, you know, no, 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 ma'am, I didn't choose Christianity. Christ chose me. You see, that's how good, good father he is, that he, he chooses us. And I quickly launched into it, and I said to her, well, here's why I believe it, because in all the other world religions, it's man trying to reach God by doing whatever he or she can. And it's, you know, sometimes it's doing things, sometimes it's reciting things, sometimes it's going to go and pray so many times a day or give so much. I said to her, but you know what's the beautiful thing about our faith is that God loved humanity so much that he sent Jesus to come and over 2,000 years ago walk this earth and then ultimately die on the cross so that you and I can have eternal life. And she paused for a moment and she said, wow, I never thought of it like that before. I never thought of Christianity like that before because you see so many people miss what is the true essence of our faith. And so again, I want to applaud you as a church for digging deeper into the subject over the next six weeks to say, right, Christianity explained. I think that is so important. I wonder just for a moment, and don't worry, I'm not going to come around and ask you, but I wonder if I came to you, those of you who have been walking in the faith for a long time, and as I look out, I see that there are some of you that have been walking this faith journey for many, many, many years. No, I'm not just saying by age. No, 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 no. no. I didn't say that. She did, not me. Some of them may be born again when they were in preschool, so it's a long time. But here's the point I'm making. If I came to you and I asked you why Christianity, what would your response be? What would you say to that question if it was posed to you in the coming weeks at work or wherever you may be or even in your community, in your complex, if a friend had to say to you, why Christianity? And you know what, for some of us it's not because we were born into it, as some of us may say. But as I look through this text, there are three, three clear visions that Isaiah has and I believe every single one of us are invited into that as well. And so I want to share them briefly this morning. Here's the first one. And it's a vision of who God is. You see, friends, if you and I want to lay hold of that which we believe in, it has to start with that foundational belief in who God is. And then we get to what he has done. But I love the way this is described in Isaiah's vision. And he does something interesting. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, 
Now, King Uzziah, if you go and you look deeper into it, he, he was one of Israel's great kings. Uh, during his reign, the country prospered. The nation prospered. The people loved their king. There, there was this sense of you know, hurt. But yes, at the end of his life, things didn't go very well. But there was still that remembrance that, hey, the earthly king is dead. But watch this. Our heavenly king is still on his throne. And so we sometimes look to our earthly leaders and we look to man. But friends, I want to say to us this morning, let's shift our focus from them and let's shift it to the God who still sits on his throne, who is high and exalted. And then I love this. Isaiah is kind of showing us the power of God. He says the train of his robe, it filled the temple. You see, again, that was a great significance because the longer the train, the more powerful the king. You know, as you've seen you know, all these movies and you've read up in all of the history that these kings would have these amazing cloaks and they, they would wear these wonderful garments and the, the train of those robes would be long. And Isaiah says, when I looked at God's train of his robe, it filled the temple. Wow. And then this powerful scene of angelic beings, they begin to declare like we did. And I love that. So how great is our God? Because that's what the angelic beings beings declared how great they were saying glory 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 to God holy is his name you see friends I want to ask you another follow-up question what's your view of God when you think of who God is what would you, words would you describe and again we're living in a day and age when people have so many different descriptions of who God is here's a few that I've heard of through the years uh, some have seen God as just kind of like what, um, I think the singer's name was Bette Midler. Some of you remember? Some of you are old enough to remember that one, yes. And the words of that song, remember, I think there were even some Christians that got quite excited when they heard that song. From a distance, God is watching us. Anyone remember that song now? From a distance. And I remember one or two even Christ followers kind of singing along to it. I'm thinking, hold on, hold on, that's bad theology. It may sound good. And let me tell you why that's bad theology, because friends, God is not watching from a distance. There is a tradition that believes that there is this great God who did create the universe, and it's kind of the idea of a wound-up clock, that you wind it up. Remember back in the old days, they used to have those little, you know, today you just set it on your watch, right? But there used to be one of those old wound clocks. Yeah, ma'am, you remember, yes. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't point. I, I didn't. <laughs> We're going to have to come back and deal with it. Anyway, so the people had this theory that God created the universe, wound it up, and just let it be. And then watched from a distance. And you know what they say? That God then this created distance between man and himself. That's not the God we serve. Some people see God as the speed cop. And my goodness, we saw a whole lot of them coming up. A traffic cop. I mean, imagine. I mean, the guy just jumps out in front of you and he puts that hand up and you, no matter who you are, no matter what car you drive, no matter where you're going, you just see that hand and you just stop. But have you noticed in our country, this is just a little vent, that uh, traffic officers, they're not really there to t serve and protect up the people. They're just there to police and give me traffic fines when I'm speeding, which I think is really not good use of their time and resources. <laughs> But you know what? Some people view God like that. This cosmic cop that every time we step out of line, he's going to jump out and go, stop. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's not who God is. He's a kind, loving God. Some people see God as an insurance broker. Okay, got a bit quiet in the room. Because <laughs> I think some of us see God like that. We've got this kind of trial balance thing going with God. We're saying, God, but, but I did all of this. You know, I even served in the tea ministry at Hilton Baptist. And I know that in a Baptist church, the most important ministry is those who serve behind that trelly door. It is most important. I served. I even did car park duty one year. I even did Sunday school. Why is this happening to me? I'll never forget one of the churches I led in, in, in Johannesburg. There was this wonderful couple. They were kind of you know, getting on in years, and they, they just desperately wanted to be parents, desperately wanted to be parents. And we would pray with them and pray for them and you know, walk that journey with them for a little bit. And there was this teenage couple in our church at around the same time that were just kind of, you know, was before the days of Netflix and 
TikTok, and so they were bored. <laughs> and after that afternoon of boredom, she fell pregnant. And I remember them sitting in my office and going, now what do we do? And I remember that older couple getting to hear about it, and they came to my office a little bit later, and they said, why would God allow that? Why would God not allow it? We've been mar- we were faithful, and the woman was, she even said, she said, we stayed faithful until our marriage, I mean, until our wedding day. Why would God do that? Why would God allow that? Why would God not give us that blessing of being parents, you know, like, or not allowing me to fall pregnant, and yet, yet, that teenage girl. Oh, friends, in moments like that, it's hard to find an answer. It's hard because here's when it really matters that then the belief in God, and I looked at them and I said, so th- does that change your belief in God? Let me give you one, ex- one more example. Um, I was with a friend years ago. We were standing and watching our two boys uh, kind of playing on the jump, jumping castles and sh- um, jungle gyms. You know, these little monkey bars and the kids love swinging on those things, right? Climbing over it and swinging over it and jumping over it. And I'm watching our two boys and they're carrying on and we're standing alongside. And it's one of those instances like, so what do you do? Now I work for CELC. What do you do? Um, I'm the pastor at the local church. And either guy suddenly quickly disappeared, you know, to go and find something. Or he leaned in. He said, ah, I've been waiting to find someone. I've got a question about why does, and this is the way he put it. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Any of you heard that before from some of your friends? And I thought for a moment, and I kind of thought, wow, that's a great question. And in that instant, I believe the Holy Spirit gave me some wisdom because our boys were busy swinging on the, on the jungle. And I said to him, mate, you love your little boy, don't you? Yes. I said, I've seen you. You are so protective. You love him. Beyond. Yes, I do. And you won't allow anything bad to happen to him? Never. I said, okay, but we're a good 20, 30 meters away from our boys right now. Yes? And if something had to happen, let's just say that while he's swinging, your little guy, he's swinging, he slips off the bunk, Jungle gym, he falls flat, there's a piece of concrete slab, he smashes his head, and, uh, and he's gone. Does that moment change who you are as a dad? Does it change that you're a loving dad? Does it change that you're a protective dad? Does it change that you always want to be providing? He kind of paused and he said, no, things happen. I said, friend, When something goes wrong, it doesn't mean that God is not who he is. He remains faithful. He remains loving. He remains a great provider. And have you noticed as well, and I said this to him, I said, isn't it amazing that people always want to question the existence of God when things go bad, but yet they never acknowledge the existence of God when there's something good? I mean, take COVID. Everyone was asking, people in and outside the church were asking that question, where's God? If you believe in a God, where is he? And when I look at this passage, friends, I am convinced that we need to have a right vision of who God is. That God is both loving and just. That God is both merciful, but at the same time, he is a God who will protect us by whatever means possible. And that's why I love what the psalmist writes. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Now, God doesn't remove us from the valley, no. But what does he do? He promises us his presence. Uh, This past week, I had to go and and help my parents move. And uh, my goodness, they have collected a lot of stuff through the years. And my mom, in particular, has collected cards. She loved, for some reason, she loved, you know, she had this thing at their church called Pollyanna. Do you guys do that here as well? No, that's good. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why now. No, so, so Pollyanna, there was this thing in their ladies' ministry. They would swap cards and gifts. And, oh, man, and, and there was stuff that she had received some 40, 50 years ago. And she's still holding on to that card. And I said to mom, you cherish the memory, but declutter, <laughs> you know? And then the one card that got my attention. And I'm sure it's a, it's a poem, it's a saying that many of you have heard before. It's the one called Footprints. Yeah. 
And I love that sentiment because, again, it reminds us of God. And, you know, it's that story of the guy that's walking along the beach and he's seeing everywhere he's going. He's seeing these two sets of footprints. One is his, one is God. Gets to that moment as he sees his life go past. And he says, but hold on. Why is it that whenever I was going through the toughest moments, I only see one set of footprints? It's in that moment he hears God's whisper and says, child, those were the times I carried you. And Maybe someone here this morning needs to hear that. Maybe someone here this morning, your belief in a God like we sang, and maybe it was hard for you to sing those words this morning. Maybe as you heard, good, good father, you're going, I, I, I don't know. Right now, I'm not feeling that. Right now, I'm not sensing that. But friend, you know what I want to say to you, like you heard earlier from Vadner? Push. Pray until something happens. Keep the faith. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay to kind of look up at God and say, where are you? Sometimes it's okay to go, why? Because, friends, he never leaves us in those moments. He stays faithful. He stays true. And that's why I love the story coming from the prodigal son where, you know, the theory that we have is this this kind of father, you know, Just that one day he looks out and he sees the sun and he runs, no, friend, I have an image that's slightly different where I believe that every morning the father would go out and think and look out into the horizon and say, maybe he returns today, maybe today. And then as the scripture tells us, the father runs to the son. You know how different that would be in today's context? I don't know of many fathers that would kind of say, my my dad would probably look there and say, I told you. What were you thinking? And yet God the Father runs to us. So what's your vision of God, number one? Number two, it's interesting that in the midst of Isaiah having this heavenly vision, he has a vision of who he is. He has a vision of who he is. The Bible says that, uh, he says, Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. You see, Isaiah suddenly becomes aware of his own iniquity, his own challenge. He looks and he says, woe to me. I live among a people of unclean lips. And friends, you and I are living in a day and age right now where there is so much unbelief. There is so much going on where people are just pushing the boundaries of belief, where people are not accepting. There was a day and age, and we were um, many, many years ago, we got trained in a ministry called EE3. Yeah, some of you remember that. Now, EE3 had this, this wonderful tool. Craig, you remember that? We got trained in there back in the day. Uh, and so we, we got this training, and, and basically the essence was uh, two questions. Now, this is how crazy it was right back then. This is like 30 years ago. You'd go up to absolute strangers and say, may I ask you a question? And back then, people didn't think you were crazy. They would say, yeah, it's okay. And then you would start with the first question is, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven? I always thought, even back then, that was so deeply encouraging to someone like, you know, <laughs> never met this person before, total stranger, and I walk up to him and I go, <laughs> you should have seen people's faces. They were like, dude, you're wishing me dead. No, 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 just work with me here. And then the follow-up question was really good. The follow-up question took it even one step further. Let's say you did die tonight. And you went up to heaven, and you were standing there, and St. Peter would say to you, why should we let you into heaven? What would your answer be? Oh, man, we used to get some great answers. I've been a good person. It was top of the list. I've never, one guy said, I've never had a drink. A drink of what? No, alcohol? I'm like, you good Baptist. Well done. (laughs) Some people would say, you know, I've given to the poor. Some people would say, you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith. And then there would be the odd person who goes, I actually don't know. I don't know. Then some people go, I don't even believe in heaven. And I remember taking a step back and going, you know, here, here's the thing, that, that you start at that spot that says, man, and then you would go into this thing of saying, hey, you know what? I remember that right in the early days, even back then, I would push them under and say, I don't really want to start the conversation with someone and say, hey, you're a sinner, <laughs> Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of God's glory. It's not a great conversation starter. But over the years, I've found some more interesting ways to say to people, I found, hey, don't you ever feel that sense that there's something missing in your life? Don't you have that sense that when you're in the midst, when you receive bad news, or when you see something happen, isn't there just that sense, as a friend of mine put it, a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that only God can fill? And don't you sense that? Don't you feel that? 
And so the view of who I am in the midst of a great, great God. Isaiah cries out and he says, I am unclean. I live among a people of unclean lips. And as I look around me and I see the community today, friends, I see there are these kind of categories of people. The first one, yes, is those that are just far from God. They are far from God. They're busy still not even, you know, they're exploring their faith and they're searching. Then there are those who are just lonely. Oh, they're the last. And remember, you know, the, the, just kind of on the edges of society, on the periphery, in the margins. And our society is getting more and more filled with people like that, that are just in the midst of very busyness, are extremely lonely. That there are people that are sensing that, yes, I may have many friends on social media, but in reality, not many. That there are sense in people, and mental health is another key subject that a lot of people are starting to grapple with friends. And we as the church need to say, okay, how do we help people? And so when you look at yourself this morning, how are you? How are you doing? What is it that you're doing? Where are you in your relationship with God? Maybe not as drastic as Isaiah that cries out, woe to me, I am an unclean man. But even when you come to that moment and you become aware of that, friend, what is your response then? And I love what happens here in this text. It's such a beautiful picture of God's atonement, of God's love. He says, then one of the seraphs flew with live coal that he had taken from the altar. And he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin has been atoned for. That's what our God does for us. It is nothing that I can do. For it is by grace that you and I have been saved, not through work so that anyone can boast but by faith in God. You see, but this whole thing of faith in God as well. As I was reading and preparing for this, I came across that passage in Mark chapter 9, and it is one of the most challenging texts that I've read in a long time. And Mark 9 is about the dad who has the demon-possessed son, and the disciples are trying to pray for over this young man, and nothing's changing, and so everybody's kind of ridiculing them. And then Jesus arrives on the scene, and he says, hey, what are you guys arguing about? And they kind of have a go at him. Your disciples are not able to help this young man. And Jesus says to him, oh, you unbelieving generation. You unbelieving generation. All things are possible for those who have faith, Jesus says. And then the father looks at Jesus and he says, if you are willing, will you heal my son? And it's one of the few moments as well where you kind of hear Jesus go, if, if I can. And this is my paraphrase of that version, right? It's kind of Jesus going, dude, have you not seen what I've just done? I have fed thousands. I have healed the blind. I have made the lame walk. And you are still asking me if I can? I wonder how many of us have that same question this morning. I wonder how many of us with something that we are grappling with, something that we are dealing with, and we are kind of looking at God and saying, if you can, will you do this? And Jesus' response is powerful. He says, all things are possible. Notice, he doesn't say, yes, you know, there's a limitation. No, no. All things are possible for those that believe. And then the Father follows up with that powerful reminder. He says, I do believe but help my unbelief. Oh, I love that. I love that frailty of his faith in that moment. He's saying, yes, I do believe, but, but you know what? Help my unbelief. My look at that, that he's saying, yes, I believe. I can sing the words of that song. I can stand with the rest of the community and declare how great is our God. Or in the old, as we sing, then sings my soul, my Savior, my God to thee. How great... Our God is, and I can sing that, yes, but you know what? When it comes to that moment, when it comes to that situation, or when it comes to that, something going wrong in my life, maybe you can say with me this morning, help my unbelief. Right, where's Mark? Mark that led our prayer time. Is he, oh, you still here, sir. You said something interesting while we were sitting back there and we were praying, and you said, hold on, you were sharing about you know, the whole concept of unbelief, that there is no such thing as unbelief. You know, people do believe, and I love that line because... 
people do believe something. Even if nothing, <laughs> that is a belief. And this whole idea of unbelieving, and yet in that moment, the father looks to Jesus and he says, Lord, help my unbelief. And then finally, he has this vision where God says to him, I want you to go into the world. You see, as I kind of weave the story of who God is, God is inviting all of us to become characters in his story. We all get to play. I remember when we were growing up, uh, we used to sing this in Sunday school, red and yellow, black and white. All are, you remember that? All are precious in his sight. Probably one of the most racist songs ever sung in Sunday school. <laughs> I mean, remember, because what about the brown? Where? <laughs> no one cared to include brown. Yeah. Red. Native Americans, yellow, Asians, no brown, <laughs> black and white. All, all, I love that, all are precious in his sight. And so God invites you to become characters in his story, friends, and I, but here's the thing, it doesn't just stop there. He then goes one step further and he says, I want you to become a carrier of that story. I want you to become a carrier of that story. And so I go back to the question I started with. If someone had to say to you, why are you a Christian? Why are you a believer? Why do you believe what you believe? How would you respond today? Because that's what God is calling you and I to become carriers of his story. And just three words, and then I'm going to close. Here's the first one. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Send me, but send me to do what? Three things, go, you've got to go. You know, the days of us waiting in a church and people coming here, friends, they're not coming. And especially after COVID, have you noticed? They're even coming less. Even people that were in the church now are not coming back because they're just going, hey, I can do this at home. This is brilliant. I can listen to Dave sitting in my pajamas. Although some of you, yeah, no. But <laughs> I can do that. I can stay at home. I don't have to come and gather. And there's a whole theory in that. And I'm sure he's shared about that. But friends, we've got to go. How many of you have watched Baywatch? Uh, come on, shame the devil, tell the truth. I see that. I see that hand. Thank you. That is one brave, courageous man of integrity. Thank you. And the rest of you all need to repent of lying. Thank you. I saw that. That hand went up a very too quickly, but that was good. Okay, let's try that again, church. How many of you have watched Baywatch? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. In all those episodes of Baywatch that many of you have not seen, <laughs> would you ever see an incident like this where someone who is drowning comes, knocks on those little white, you know those little white pondokis they have, and say, please help me, Mr. Hasselhoff, I'm drowning. <laughs> would you ever see that, sir? No. Why not? Are they allowed to talk back in the church? <laughs> why, why not? Why would you never see that? They're too busy running. Uh, yeah. Why would you never see that? Someone. Thank you, ma'am. They're busy drowning in the water. If they could knock on the door, <laughs> they wouldn't need that. You know, when I was thinking about this, there's a, there are multitudes out there that need to hear the story of God, that need to hear about the good, good father we sang about this one, that need to hear that there is a great God who loves them so much that he wants them to be in relationship with him. But you've got to go, and you've got to be a carrier of that story. And you know what I love about the gospel is that you get to do it. You share, you say, there was a time in my life when this is what was happening, when this is what I used to do, but then, but then, there was a turning point, and Jesus got hold of me. And then I experienced God like I've never experienced it before. And today, I'm yes, it doesn't mean life is great. It doesn't mean that everything is answered. No, but you know what I do know? That when I do try and find the answer, I know where to go. And so number one, you've got to go. Number two, you've got to ask. I think too often we go in by trying to do that. We need to ask people, hey, tell me your story. 
because everyone has a story. Um, one of the groups that I worked with and did some campaigns with is Heartlines. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen any of their movies and stuff. They've got some great stuff happening right now around Father Matters. But uh, they did a, a movie, produced a movie years ago called Beyond the River, um, which is based on a true life story of the guys who did the doozy. And uh, there's this one powerful, powerful scene in the movie. The younger guy looks up at the older guy and he says, Steve, you may know my name, but do you know my story? You may know my name, but do you know my story? And all of us, as we sit here, every single one of us have a story to share, have a story to tell. Yes, there's some of us now, we are part of God's story. We are characters in his story. Will you become a carrier of his story? But would you take a moment to ask that person and say to them, hey, I'd love to hear that. Hey, I can see this. I know there's a story. And then thirdly, would you tell them your story with God? So go, ask, tell. Go, ask, tell. But before you do that, you've got to respond, here I am, send me, Lord. And as we close together this morning, I, I've shared with you these three visions of who God is, who we are, the challenges that you and I are facing, and then the vision of the world that God's called us to go, ask, and tell. And as we close this morning, I want to ask you that question. Hey, how's your vision of God this morning? Does it need just a little bit of realignment? Does it need just to be refocused? Just that today may be just that encouragement that you needed. Or maybe this morning you're like Isaiah that just needs to say, Lord, I need atonement. Lord, I need forgiveness. Lord, I need you to come and to set me free from something. In the New Testament, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is in a synagogue. He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. It's later on in Isaiah 61. And it says, Arise, the Lord, you know, he's come to set captives free and he's come to bind up the brokenhearted. Set captives free and bind up the brokenhearted. And this morning, there may be people here that are needing to be set free and many of us that are needing to have hearts to be mended. And then would you go? If you are someone who is firm in your faith, who's been walking with God and has a strong faith, don't keep it to yourself. Share. Share with someone. Tell them why you have this faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had today. The opportunity to gather together to declare our belief in who you are and what you've done. God, thank you for this timely reminder from the prophet Isaiah. Thank you, Lord, that we get to learn such important lessons from his vision. today, Lord, as we gather here in this community, Father, we pray that you would strengthen our faith. We pray that you would give us boldness to be carriers of your story. And so, friends, as we are just remembering the words of the songs we sang, the message we've just heard. If there's someone here this morning that says, you know what, today I need to have an experience like that. I need for God to reach out to me and set me free from something. Set me free from unbelief. Set me free from maybe something that I've been holding on to for too long that I need to let go of today. Maybe you're back in church after a very long time and, and today is again another reminder that you are dearly loved by a great God. 
and his invitation to you is to be set free, is to receive that freedom. And so my friend, if that's you this morning, then I'd love to pray with you and pray for you. And all you need to do is just eyes are closed, heads are bowed, no one's looking around. It's just as you and God. Would you allow me to pray with you and just raise your hand. By raising your hand, all you're doing is you're saying, Ed, pray with me, pray for me. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, thank you. And so Father, we wanna pray for those that raise their hands and by raising their hands and standing in your presence and saying, Lord, here I am. I need your freedom. I need to be set free. I need to be released. And Father, you know today that which they need to be released from. And then God, I want to pray for those of us that need to have our hearts mended. Lord, there are things that are challenging our faith and our belief this morning. God, I pray for us, Lord. God, I pray that you would strengthen our faith. God, I pray that you would come just reveal your truth afresh to us, Lord, I pray. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity. I pray, God, now that as we all become carriers of your story, may your Holy Spirit empower us to speak boldly and courageously. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.